Hello and welcome to the Professional Standards in Child Nutrition Programs webinar. My name is Claudia Vincent and I'm the Nutrition Program Specialist for the Northeast Region and the State of Missouri. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the DESE Food and Nutrition website under Summer Workshops Conclude. There will be a chance to ask questions at the end of the presentation. My panelist, Nick Gorham, will help moderate questions. Please feel free to enter questions into the chat box at the right of your screen. All right, let's begin. Our goals for today are to provide you with an overview of the professional standards required for all school nutrition program employees, to describe standards and requirements for training and hiring for specific job categories within school nutrition programs, to share resources on how to obtain and track training hours for school nutrition program employees, and to answer questions that frequently come up regarding professional standards. Why do we need professional standards? And what purpose do professional standard requirements serve? The Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act of 2010 requires the United States Department of Agriculture to create professional standards for state and local school nutrition program employees. These standards ensure that school nutrition personnel have the knowledge, training, and tools they need to plan, prepare, and purchase products to create nutritious, safe, and enjoyable meals for program participants. By implementing professional standards requirements, the goals are to assist local education agencies in recruiting, hiring, training, and retaining qualified school nutrition staff, to enhance the image of school nutrition professionals and their influence within their community, and to help build skills and empower school nutrition staff to lead and efficiently operate school nutrition programs. To help accomplish these goals, standards have been established for school nutrition training and hiring processes. First, let's go ahead and look at training standards and how to comply with training requirements. Training standards encompass several topics. So to get an overview of these training standards, we need to understand the requirements for the various job categories, training topics, training resources, and tracking methods that help make up the broad topic of professional standards training requirements. Jobs within school nutrition programs can be broken down into four main categories, program directors, managers, staff, and part-time and non-program staff. It is important to understand the functions of these job categories in order to comply with the different standards that apply to each category. Before we discuss the training requirements for each of the separate job categories, we need to define what we mean when we refer to someone as a program director, manager, staff, or part-time staff. Program director refers to the local individuals who are directly responsible for the management of the day-to-day -day operations of the school nutrition programs for all participating schools under the jurisdiction of the School Food Authority. There are several different scenarios and possibilities on how the term program director is defined. Larger LEAs may have one person designated as the director who is responsible for the oversight of all school nutrition program employees and operations, as well as the administrative aspects of running the school nutrition program. Smaller LEAs might designate their lead cook as the program director since they are responsible for the oversight of other kitchen staff and daily operations, but they might assign other responsibilities to school administration staff, such as a principal or bookkeeper. Other LEAs choose to contract their school nutrition programs out to a food service management company, and their director may be an employee of that company instead of someone directly employed by the LEA. Each of these situations is an example of who would be considered a program director. The program manager category 
refers to individuals who are directly responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the school nutrition programs for participating schools. This description is very similar to that of directors, but managers' responsibilities are different in that they are not responsible for the oversight of the school nutrition program in its entirety. Typically, a manager is someone who oversees a specific operation within the nutrition program. So an example might be a manager who's in charge of the oversight of operations and employees in the kitchen, but doesn't really have many duties related to the administrative functions of the school nutrition program. Since larger LEAs tend to operate more sites, they may have more than one program manager who oversees one specific site since the director cannot be present at all times at each individual site. Smaller schools often do not have a program manager due to the lower number of nutrition program employees. Many smaller LEAs find it feasible for the program director to serve the functions of both director and manager without much issue. The program staff category refers to local individuals who do not have managerial responsibilities and are involved in the routine operations of the school nutrition programs for participating schools. Program staff may include kitchen workers who prepare and serve meals and process transactions at the point of service. The description for part-time staff is exactly the same as that for program staff, the difference being that part-time staff refers to any school nutrition program employee who works less than 20 hours per week. Most schools, large and small, employ part-time cooks, dishwashers, and other kitchen staff who may work only during the meal service. Individuals outside of the school nutrition program whose responsibilities include duties related to the operation of the school nutrition program are also considered part-time. These individuals may be administrative staff, such as secretaries or bookkeepers, who have duties related to food service. So for example, the determining officials for free and reduced applications. There are also times when multiple people may share the responsibilities of a program director. Some LEAs may designate a lead cook or kitchen employee as a program director, although that, pe although that person may not oversee some of the administrative aspects of the program. Other schools might designate a superintendent as their director, and they may oversee the administrative functions of the program, while a program manager or other kitchen employee is in charge of meal services and other kitchen operations. In these situations, only the person who performs the majority of the program director duties must meet the training standards for program directors. It is also possible that the duties of a program director are split evenly, as could be the case with either of the two situations we just mentioned. In both of these situations, one person must be designated as the program director and meet the training requirements for directors. The other person who is not designated as the director must still meet the training requirements for either managers, program staff, or part-time staff. Each of these job categories have specific training requirements that must be met annually. Now that we've looked at how these job categories are defined, let's look at the training requirements for each category. Each school year, school nutrition program employees are responsible for completing a specific number of training hours. Annual minimum training requirements vary based on job, job categories. Directors are required to complete 12 training hours, managers 10, full-time staff six, and part-time staff four. When we talk about annual requirements, we are referring to the 12 months between July 1 and June 30th in any given year. For example, the 2020-21 school year begins July 1, 2020, and ends June 30th, 2021. Please note that substitutes and volunteer staff are not subject to the minimum training requirements and do not need to complete annual training hours.
Another exception to the minimum training requirements applies to any food service employee that is hired after January 1 in any given school year. These employees are only required to complete half of the required training hours for their position. For example, if a director is hired after January 1 in the 2020-21 school year, they would only be required to complete six hours of annual training instead of 12 hours. When assessing training needs for employees in each job category, it is important to consider training that is job specific and intended to enhance the individual employee's skill and performance. For a full-time cook whose only duties are meal prep and service, it wouldn't make much sense to receive training hours on how to approve free and reduce price applications. Along the same lines, a bookkeeper whose only duties related to food service are approving applications and completing verification probably doesn't need training on meal components or meal production records. Although it never hurts for any employee to gain a broad perspective of, of how school nutrition programs operate, employees in each job category should receive training that is specific to their position and duties. This training can be provided in a number of different formats, like conference calls, online classes, in-person trainings, local meetings or conferences, and live or pre-recorded webinars, such as the one that you're watching now. As we have seen, annual training requirements differ depending on which job category an employee falls under. It is particularly important for directors to understand training requirements as they are required to receive the most training. While directors are responsible for completing 12 hours of training annually, new directors are also required to have eight hours of food safety training. This training must have occurred either within the past five years of the director's starting date or they must complete the training within 30 days of their starting date. In addition to the initial food safety training, directors are required to maintain food safety certification while they are employed in the school nutrition program. Once the initial training is complete, food safety training in subsequent years may be counted towards the director's annual training hours. However, it may not be counted in their first year as a food service director. Food safety training is also encouraged for all nutrition program staff, though not required. We do not require a specific training certification, but we do require a minimum of eight hours of food safety training. These eight hours do not contribute to the 12 annual hours of training for a food service director the first year of employment, but do apply after example, if the food safety training expires after five years, then the renewal course will count towards the 12 annual hours of training. Here are two examples of food safety training that food service directors may obtain. We have Serve Safe on the left and ICN Food Safety in Schools on the right. Another way to get food safety training is inquiring through your local health department. The website above can help you find your county's health department. Being a director means taking responsibility for not only your own training, but also for the oversight of training for program managers and staff. Part of this responsibility may even include providing training hours for other nutrition program employees. <clears throat> Directors might be in charge of conducting an in-person training or meeting or moderate, moderating a conference call or online training session. In these situations, any training that is offered to program staff by a director or manager may be used to count towards his or own training hours. However, if multiple identical training sessions are offered on the same topic, only the time spent on one of the training sessions may count towards the director's or manager's annual training hours. Complying with the annual training requirements is important, 
but there may be times when an employee is not able to complete all of their required training hours in the current school year. In these situations, the state agency may allow for training hours to be completed over a period of two school years. However, training completed each year is only allowed to be counted once for one school year and not for both the current and next school years. If nutrition staff ends up completing more or less than their required annual hours, excess or deficient training hours may be carried over to either the previous or subsequent school year. Let's go ahead and look at an example of each situation and how the two-year flexibility applies to annual training requirements. Both of the examples we are about to look at apply to the annual training requirements for directors. The first example on the left of the screen shows a director who completed 18 training hours in the first year of the two-year flexibility period. The excess six hours are carried to the subsequent school year, and the director only needs to complete another six hours to meet the annual requirement. In the second example on the right, the director completed only 10 training hours in the first year of the flexibility period. This means that in the subsequent school year, they will need to complete 14 hours of training in order to meet the annual requirements for both years. There are, of course, other possible scenarios that would apply to the two-year flexibility option. In any situation, nutrition staff must meet the two-year total training requirements for their position to utilize two-year flexibility and remain in compliance. Recent school closures due to the COVID-19 pandemic have presented many unique challenges related to school nutrition programs. When it comes to professional standards and training requirements, safety concerns and social distancing guidelines may prevent in-person trainings and conferences from occurring. Many schools have expressed concern on how employees can complete their annual training hours when these options are not available. This is a great example of when online trainings, webinars, and conference calls can be used to complete hours when in-person when in training is not possible. There are also several webinars and online training sessions that are specific to topics related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Since these trainings count towards employees' annual training hours, they can be very beneficial in staying updated on issues related to the current situation, as well as completing training hours. While webinars and other online trainings are a great alternative when in-person trainings are not an option, some school nutrition service employees may not have access to technology that's required to complete these types of training sessions. This may be a good time to utilize training requirement flexibility. So for any employees who are not able to complete training hours before experiencing school closures due to the COVID-19 pandemic, any remaining hours can be carried over to the next school year. Now let's look at training topics as they relate to specific job categories. The USDA has provided a list of suggested job specific training topics to help guide your choices on training subject matter as it relates to job categories. These topics align with four key areas, nutrition, operations, administration, and communications marketing. As you can see here, the list breaks down training topics by key area, making it easy and convenient to see which trainings align with which job category. As we talked about earlier, training should be targeted to job specific topics. A bookkeeper whose only duties related to food service are processing free and reduced price applications probably doesn't need training session on menu planning or food production. The USDA's list makes it easier to see which key areas and training topics match with each job category. Each training topic and key area is assigned a four-digit code. 
To help link training topics to key areas, the first number of each training topic's four-digit code corresponds with that of the key area's codes. So, for the, in the example here, the key area of nutrition is coded 1000. The corresponding code for each training topic under the key area of nutrition will also start with the number one, just like we see in the illustration here. The simple coding system is designed to further help you choose job-specific trainings related to the different job categories. Several different trainings are offered under each topic code in the four key areas, and each training topic has specific learning objectives that should guide your decisions on training choices related to job categories. Training topics in the key area of nutrition are menu planning, nutrition education, and general nutrition. Training topics in the key area of operations include food production, serving food, cashier and point of service, purchasing and procurement, receiving and storage, and food safety and HACCP. Training topics in the key area of administration include free and reduced price meal benefits, program management, financial management, human resources, and facilities and equipment planning. The communications and marketing topic under the key area of communication provides participants the ability to develop plans that include involvement with school and community and to empower school nutrition leaders to provide excellent customer service to all program participants. Now that we have an idea of how the training topics available in each key area can help you make decisions that align training with job categories, let's go ahead and look at training resources and where to find training. As we've discussed, training can be obtained in a variety of ways, including in-person trainings and workshops, conference calls, and online classes and webinars. One valuable training resource is the USDA's Professional Standards website. As shown in the screenshot from USDA's Professional Standards homepage, training can be found relating to each of the four training topic key areas. Clicking on the link to a specific key area will lead you to lists of available online training topics related to that key area. Another valuable resource for online trainings and webinars is the Institute of Child Nutrition website. Although many of the trainings available through the ICN are listed as in-person, most of them can be downloaded in online presentation format. This is a great way to get training hours when in-person training is not a possibility. With the many responsibilities placed on directors, being in charge of training staff can be challenging, especially if the director is in charge of the presentation. The presentations and transcripts available through ICN can help to ease the pressure on directors and managers who are, responsibility, who are responsible for providing training hours to their staff. These trainings can be presented as they are and will eliminate the time it would take directors to develop a presentation from scratch. A few other excellent online resources can be found in the DESI Food and Nutrition Services website. As illustrated in the screenshot, the quick link section of the page has a section dedicated to professional standards. The professional standards section of the DESI FNS website provides resources for many topics relating to professional standards, like the final rule, the manual, the USDA Professional Standards Training Tracker tool, which we'll go over in a bit, and some frequently asked questions. The Professional Standards section does not directly provide training hours, but each of these resources provide in-depth information on professional standards requirements. Answers to, to most questions related to professional standards can be found through these resources.
Another resource available on the DESI FNS website are the Serving with Success e-learning modules. These video training sessions are another convenient way to complete training hours when in-person training is not a feasible option. To access Serving with Success training, click the e-learning module Serving with Success link on the DESI FNS homepage. From this menu, choose any of the links to view the Serving with Success training module to complete training hours. The variety of topics available are designed specifically to help kitchen and administrative staff understand the rules and regulations involved in operating school nutrition programs within USDA guidelines. Another resource available on the DESI FNS website are the summer workshop webinars. These webinars were previously recorded for the 2019 and 2020 summer workshops. This year's workshop webinars will also be posted. To access webinars and workshops, click the newsletters, webinars, and workshops link on the DESI FNS homepage. From this menu, choose any of the links to complete the webinar of your choice. Completion of the Serving with Success modules and DESI webinars also makes tracking your training hours easy. When you have finished watching the video training session, you have the option of taking a short quiz or survey related to the topic. When you complete the quiz or survey, you can print or save a certificate of completion that shows the training topic and how many training hours the module counts for. Tracking your training hours is an important aspect of training requirements. Let's look at some of the other methods you can use to track training hours and maintain compliance with in professional standards guidelines. Since professional standards are a requirement under the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010, an LEA's adherence to USDA guidelines is evaluated during an administrative review. The school must provide sufficient records showing that all school nutrition program staff are completing their required annual training hours. As a general rule, records listing the employee name, employer or school name, training title, topic and objectives, training source, date training is completed, total training hours completed, and the school year the training is applied to is sufficient. Next, we'll look at some examples of documentation and other tracking mechanisms that would be appropriate for demonstrating compliance with training requirements. One method for tracking employees' training hours is the USDA Training Tracker Tool. As mentioned previously, the Training Tracker Tool can be accessed from the Professional Standards section of the DESI FNS website. The tool offers a convenient way to track and store training information that can be easily accessed during an administrative review. You can find a webinar with detailed instructions on how to complete the USDA Training Tracker Tool, which was updated recently to showcase the tool's new features. The updates to the USDA Training Tracker Tool are, Users may edit their profile with their role and job category, the ability to search and select correct training titles, adjust training requirements for users who have hiring dates of January 1, the state agency has the ability to run reports for local education agencies undergoing an administrative review, deactivation of employees no longer working within the district, and reward and achievement badges that show once the user completes items in key areas. We'll pause the PowerPoint segment to do a run through on the USDA Professional Standards Training Tracker tool. I'll show you how to log in, enter training, and run a report.
First, we'll navigate to the DESI FNS website. Then click on the Professional Standards link under the Quick Link tab. Then select the Professional Standards Training Tra Tracker Tool link, which will take you out of the DESI FNS website onto the USDA site. If you do not already have a USDA account, click Create Account and follow the instructions provided by the USDA. In this example, I'll take you to the login with my USDA login account. Just note that my state agency interface may look a little different than a school food authority account, but not by much. Let's click the green login button at the bottom of the page. You'll enter your user ID and password on the right of the screen. Then click Login with your password. Now that we've covered the login portion of this training, let's move to entering the actual training. So first we'll enter a course that is already listed in the tracker database. This could be a training already entered in by this food service director or manager. Go up to the blue banner and select the drop down training heading. Select log training. Since this example is showing how to log training in a course already listed in the database, start typing the name of the course in the training title text box. In this case, we'll just type in civil rights modesi. Okay. So since we've selected this training that's already in the database, we'll scroll down and select key areas listed for the training selected. So in this case, we'll just select all training categories in the table below. You can alter the completion date, school year, and any comments needed. If you are a director or manager, you can select employees that also attended the training. But in this case, I'll just select myself. Go ahead and click log training once your entry is completed. Okay, now I'll show you how to enter training that is not already listed in the database. For this example, we'll just go back to the home screen where you can see that the training that we just logged is showing up on our account page. So to add training, we're going to go ahead and log training. And then since this is a new training title that isn't already in the database, we'll select the add new training title. For this example, we'll go ahead and use this class name, Professional Standards and CN Programs. Today is gonna to be an hour. Training format is webinar. And training provider is DESI Food and Nutrition Services. And then we'll go ahead and enter in the training categories. For this session, we will go ahead and select administration, 3210 staff management, 3260 administrative review, since we're covering some items in the administrative review, and then 3430 training plans and tracking.
Then we'll go ahead and save training title. Now you can see how you're able to log this training for yourself and your employees, just like we did in the first example. And normally you'd go ahead and click log training, but we're just gonna go to our third item on our list here, and that's how to select reports. So I'm just gonna cancel out of this. Okay. So now I'll show you how to create a report on training completed by the school. What you'll want to do is go ahead and go back to your homepage, select reports, and this will take you to a detailed report. Here you'll see you can select the school year, select the school category. Here you can see state, this is an example of how your interface might be a little bit different than mine. So we'll go ahead and select school. Missouri should already be logged in there. And then you'll select your school district. Here are multiple school districts in Missouri. Um, you will see that this can change from district to district. So we'll go ahead and select just a random district here. And you can see that for this school, they have both of their buildings. They have multiple employees already logged in. And so this is where you can select um, multiple types of training. You can go by job title, key area, training topic. I really encourage you to play around with this feature. It's really helpful, especially for your administrative review. So you can just create a report based on different trainings or the school year. It's really up to you and what your uh, motives are for this report. You'd go ahead and select generate report, but in this case, we'll just go to back to our homepage. Thanks for following. Thanks for following me around on this tool. Remember that the USDA also has a more in-depth webinar on how to navigate this tool. It can be found on the professional standards page on the DESE FNS website. Okay, let's go back to our PowerPoint. While using the USDA tracking tool can be a great way to organize and access training records, it is not the only method that is acceptable and using it is optional. Another convenient way to track training hours is to use tracking records that list everything needed to comply with the tracking requirements, such as the one shown here. Smaller LEAs may only have a few employees, and they may find it more convenient to keep a file for each employee that contains tracking records such as these for quick and easy access. Other records that might be added to an employee's file in addition to tracking training are training sign-in sheets, such as those sometimes used for tracking group trainings that occur in person. Um, sometimes this can be the DESE civil rights tracking sheet or certificates of completion like those that accompany the serving success and webinar training modules. All of these are acceptable methods for tracking training hours, and any of these tracking mechanisms may be used to maintain compliance with training tracking guidelines. You may also want to create your own tracking mechanism that best suits your program and training practices. This is also acceptable as long as the mechanism contains all the elements required for compliance. If you create your own tracking mechanism, but are unsure if its compliance meets the USDA guidelines, 
the nutrition program specialist in your region should be able to help you decide and tailor it to suit your needs while maintaining compliance. Job categories, training requirements and resources, and tracking your training hours all combine to make up the training standards you'll need to adhere to in order to remain in compliance with professional standards guidelines. Professional standards guidelines also create the need for hiring standards within school nutrition programs. At the beginning of the presentation, we talked about some of the goals establishing and implementing professional standards. Hiring standards are designed to assist in recruiting, hiring, and retaining qualified school nutrition staff and to enhance the image of school nutrition professionals and their influence in the community. In much the same way that training requirements vary according to job categories, hiring standards vary according to enrollment categories. LEAs are grouped into three separate enrollment categories, 2,499 or less, 2,500 to 9,999, and 10,000 or more. Just as training standards apply to all school nutrition employees, Enrollment categories applied to hiring standards for new program directors. For LEAs with 2,499 students or less, a director must have one of the listed qualifications below. There is one exception that applies to hiring standards for new directors. LEAs with less than 500 students may be approved to hire a candidate with a high school diploma and less than the required experience if there are no other qualified candidates in that area. So like we said in our last slide, in LEAs with less than 500 students, food service director applicants with less than three years of relevant work experience may still be hired upon state agency approval of the professional standards exemption form seen on the right of the screen. The form can be found on the DESE professional standards webpage. Relevant experience may also include documented unpaid or volunteer hours involving food service activities. The LEA must submit this form to DESE FNS for approval before hiring the applicant. Directors for LEAs with 2,500 to 9,999 students must have one of the listed qualifications below. Note that educational experience refers to college credits completed by an individual who does not meet all the requirements for a bachelor's or associate's degree. The third enrollment category applies to LEAs with 10,000 students or more. Directors for LEAs in this category must have one of the listed qualifications below. One frequently asked question regarding hiring standards is, what is considered a related major or area of concentration? Specific majors and areas of study include food service management, dietetics, family and, con and consumer sciences, nutrition education, culinary arts, business, and other related fields like food science or hospitali hospitality management. Any of these majors or fields would be acceptable experience for directors in any of the three enrollment categories. These standards are the minimum hiring criteria for any new school nutrition program director hired on or after July 1, 2015. Hiring criteria is dependent on LEA enrollment size and, as we have seen, as enrollment increases, program demands and complexity increase. Other than the flexibility offered to LEAs with less than 500 students, the hiring criteria must be met for all new directors.
One other exception applies to directors who are hired prior to July 1, 2015. These directors are allowed to remain in their current positions without meeting the hiring standards. They may also fill a new director position within the same LEA enrollment category or smaller category without meeting the hiring standards. However, these directors still must meet the hiring standards if they wish to apply for a director position with an LEA in a larger enrollment category. The ICN has provided job description templates for the food service director position. It outlines essential responsibilities such as customer service, food and personnel safety, financial management, and record keeping and food production. Further director responsibilities include procurement, program accountability, nutrition standards and menu planning, general management of child nutrition programs, food service staff management, kitchen and cafeteria layout design and equipment, waste management, marketing of child nutrition programs, computer technology for student information systems and menu planning and running reports, nutrition education, and other res responsibilities such as communication, program proficiency, and customer service. Earlier, we talked about instances where the role of a program director is shared. In some schools, district level program responsibilities are divided into several positions. So, for example, a business manager, an administrative assistant, and a principal may all perform the duties of a program director. Again, just as we saw with training standards requirements, one person must be designated as a program director even when the duties are shared. In respect to hiring standards, only the person hired to perform the majority of the duties of a program director is required to meet the standards. The review of professional standards is important for the LEA's administrative review. Let's go ahead and do a run through of what will be covered. The administrative review offsite questionnaire and web apps will ask the school food authority the following questions. The LEA student enrollment number, employee count for directors, managers, full-time, part-time, and staff hired after January 1st and non-school and non-school nutrition staff with child nutrition program responsibilities. Food service director must list their food safety training and hiring standard requirements. If all food service employees in all roles have met training requirements for the school year being reviewed, if the state agency allowed an extension on annual training requirements, and if the director or manager is tracking training hours. The on-site questionnaire will request the following documentation. The frequency in which training hours are being tracked, the up-to-date training tracker tool the school is using, training certificates, and if any employees were hired in the time between the off-site and on-site questionnaires during the review. On the topic of the administrative review, let's go ahead and go through an example of a finding for a food service director not meeting hiring standards. In this example, the finding will be, it was discovered that a food service director hired after July 1, 2015 does not have the minimum education or experience needed for the director position. So to respond to this corrective action in a few scenarios, first off, the state agency will work with the school to determine a corrective action plan to bring the school into compliance with the hiring standards on a case-by-case -case basis. The food service director will have to work towards meeting the education and or experience requirement. If they don't have a degree, but have some college credits, the plan might involve an SNA credential program that would provide the same hours as a degree. So in our first scenario, if the school has 500 students or less and the food service director has education requirements, 
but not the experience, then the School Food Authority will need to submit an exemption form to the state agency for approval. In our second scenario, if the school has less than 2,500 students, then the state agency could approve the director's salary to be paid from the food service account while they are working toward meeting the requirements. In our third scenario, if there are more than 2,500 students, the salary couldn't be paid from the school food service account. It would have to be paid from general funds. In all of the above scenarios, the coordinator of the state agency would be the one who would approve the plan to meet the hiring requirements and would work with the LEA. Okay, this concludes the Professional Standards and Child Nutrition Programs webinar. Um, myself and Nick Gorham will do our best to answer your questions live. If I'm not able to answer your question right off the bat or need to dig a bit deeper, run out of time, I ask that you email me your questions at claudia.vincent at desi.mo.gov so I can give you a thorough answer. Please use the raise hand feature to signal that you have a question. You can also enter your question into the chat feature. Once I or Nick call on you, please unmute yourself. Again, if I don't get to your question during this webinar, please feel free to reach out with an email. Okay, so far Nick and I are not seeing any hands raised or any questions in the chat. I'll go ahead and give you all a minute or two if anyone's trying to come up with their question. Um, also, if you don't want to ask a question publicly, again, emailing me is just fine as well. Are we going to be able to print off the uh, forms at the end of the video. Yes, so in event squid where you are registered, um, there are documents for this webinar. So I believe I posted the uh, webinar PowerPoint along with the um, exemption form and a few templates as well. Okay, we'll just give you guys another minute just in case there are any last minute questions here. Okay, well, thank you all so much for attending today's webinar on professional standards and child nutrition programs. Um, I really appreciate Nick Gorham helping me out with questions and just getting this webinar going in general. Um, you guys have a great summer, have a great afternoon, and again, feel free to reach out with any questions after the webinar. This will be posted, like I said earlier, um, in our webinars on the DESE website. So feel free to go back and 
soak up any information that you might have missed during this webinar. Thanks again and have a great afternoon.